Throughout the majority of the 20th century, Yugoslavia was a nation in the Balkans made up of many different Slavic people. Following the fall of communism and the rise of independence movements throughout Eastern Europe and Central Asia during the late 1980s and early 1990s, Yugoslavia then broke up into several different nations throughout a series of congruent wars along ethnic, cultural, and religious boundaries. The Yugoslav wars overall were some of the most brutal and deadliest conflicts in recent history and was the worst European war since World War II. As a result of the dispute, Yugoslavia no longer exists, but rather in its place the independent nations of Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina, North Macedonia, and Kosovo. While the war is over, deep-seated hostilities still remain among the people of these nations. In the world of football, Yugoslavia's national team was often a strong team on both the European and world stage. From the first World Cup in 1930 up until 1990, Yugoslavia qualified eight times, reaching the quarterfinals on numerous occasions and even finishing fourth twice. At the Euros, Yugoslavia was successful as well, winning silver in two tournaments while also coming in fourth once. Some of the best footballers of the 20th century hailed from Yugoslavia such as Dragan Jakic, Pitsky Stokovic, Pape Susic, and Josip Katalinski. Yugoslavia also had some very successful club teams like Dynamo Zagreb, Red Star Belgrade, and Partisan Belgrade, among many others. But obviously, the breakup of Yugoslavia also saw the breakup of its national team, with all their successor states going on to have national teams of their own. Of these new countries, they have each gone to produce several great players over the past three decades, and some teams have even gone on to achieve their own success. So this goes to beg the question, what would a Yugoslav national team look like today if the country never broke up? Now, many articles have been written and many YouTube videos have been created already addressing this topic. So my question goes a little further. How far would a unified Yugoslav national team have gone in Euro 2020 and the 2018 World Cup? So in our hypothetical universe, let's say that the fall of communism in the late 1980s and 1990s did not lead to ethnic tensions and directly the collapse of Yugoslavia, but rather a transition towards a non-socialist state with no desire for breakaway states, similar to what occurred in Poland, Hungary, Romania, and other Eastern European nations at the same time. Instead of the unified nation no longer existing, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia would just become the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia or the United States of Yugoslavia or something similar. And as an obvious result, the Yugoslav national team remains intact. Fast forward to Euro 2020 and the Yugoslav national team would remain one of the best teams in Europe. Because many people have already addressed what this whole unified team may look like, I will just show you what I think the starting 11 would have been in the summer of 2021. With the available players, the formation I'm going to go with is a 4-2-3-1. In goal will be Jan Oblak, while the back line from right to left will be Josip Juranovic, Stefan Savic, Stefan Mitrovic, and Alexander Kolarov. The two deep midfielders would be Luka Modric and Mirlan Pjanic, while above them is Josip Ilicic, Dusan Tadic, and Ivan Perisic. Then the lone striker up top would be Edin Dzeko. Following the breakup of Yugoslavia, the Serbian national team was mostly recognized to be the successor, and they filmed the former nation's seat as a member of FIFA and UEFA. However, Serbia did not qualify for Euro 2020, in fact only two former states of Yugoslavia did, Croatia and North Macedonia. Given that in our hypothetical team, there are far more Croats than Macedonians, the unified Yugoslav team will take the place of Croatia alongside the Czech Republic, England and Scotland in Group D. In real life, Croatia did decent enough in the group stage, losing to England 1-0 in the opening match, then tying the strong Czech Republic side 1-1. Their fate was decided in the final match after a hard-fought 3-1 win over Scotland, sending them to the knockout stage with a second place finish. While they were tied on 4 points with the Czech Republic and with the same goal difference, they finished above the Czechs by virtue of more goals scored. Though our Yugoslav team is obviously a very strong one, this group was very tough. Even Scotland, who finished last, was far from a poor team. Given how strong England was, particularly in defense, I still see them being able to get the better of Yugoslavia. Even the Czech Republic was in electric form this tournament, meaning a 1-1 draw, just like in real life, is not unrealistic. So as a result, Yugoslavia still finished second in the group, behind England, meaning they will face Spain in the round of 16. While the Spanish side from Euro 2020 had some very visible flaws, 
They were still overall a very good team, and some of their greatest strengths include their ability to control the midfield, move the ball quickly, and create a large number of chances. When you compare that to this Yugoslav team, they would find themselves facing the same obstacles that Croatia did against Spain. The Spanish simply dominated the midfield and held onto the ball better. Just looking at our Yugoslav front four, each player is at least 32 years old or older. While this team is clearly talented, they are also very old and they run the risk of just seeing the match go by them. In an absolutely crazy match, Spain eliminated Croatia 5-3 in real life. While our unified Yugoslav team may not concede 5, it is hard to see them overcoming this powerful Spanish team and unfortunately, the Yugoslav Euro 2020 journey comes to a close in the round of 16. However, the story doesn't end here. What if, say, we rewind the years a bit when the core spine of this team wasn't so advanced in age, and then see how they fare? For example, how would a unified Yugoslav team perform at the 2018 World Cup? Well, just like when reviewing Euro 2020, first we have to outline at least what the starting 11 would look like, since we have gone a few years in the past, and the lineup is a little different. The formation of this team would be the same 2-3-1, though the wingers would be slightly more narrow. In goal, we still have Jan Oblak, but the back line reading right to left will be Sime Versako, Stefan Savic, Dayan Lovren, and Alexander Kolarov. The two deep midfielders would still be Luka Modric and Mirjam Pjanic, but the trio ahead of them would be Dusan Tadic, Ivan Rakitic, and Mario Mandzukic. Up top still remains Edin Dzeko. Now, coming off the bench, we'll also have a wealth of talent such as Nikola Maksimovic, Mateo Kovacic, Ivan Perisic, Marcelo Brozovic, Sergei Malinkovic Savic, Demogoy Vida, among many, many others. If you think back to June 2018, you can easily see how much better this team would be back then as opposed to Euro 2020. For example, players like Luka Modric and Miralem Pjanic just came off arguably their best season of their career, while Dusan Tadic was about to head into his best season in just a few months. In fact, with the exception of Jan Oblak, every single player who featured in both our hypothetical World Cup 2018 squad and Euro 2020 squad was significantly better back in 2018. You could even make a strong argument for this unified Yugoslav team being the best team in the world at the time. As we said before, for administrative purposes, Serbia was seen as the successor for Yugoslavia's spot in FIFA and UEFA. Therefore, since Serbia qualified for this World Cup, our theoretical Yugoslav team would simply take their position in Group E alongside Brazil, Switzerland, and Costa Rica. Croatia, the other Yugoslav successor state who qualified for the 2018 World Cup, will be replaced by Greece, the team they eliminated in the playoffs to reach the World Cup. This will be important for later. In real life, Serbia narrowly defeated Costa Rica 1-0 before succumbing to a dramatic 2-1 loss following a 90-minute winner from Jordan Shakiri. Then in their final group game, they are outplayed by Brazil and lost 2-0, eliminating them from the World Cup. With a squad made up of United Yugoslav players, this team would perform very differently in our hypothetical universe. Costa Rica was fantastic at the 2014 World Cup, but four years later, much of the team had gotten older and passed their prime. While Serbia had done just enough to defeat them, our Yugoslav team would easily see them off 2-0. In the next match, Switzerland were certainly no pushover, but with the added talent in this unified squad, they should have enough to overcome their opponents. While Switzerland was able to win 2-1 in real life, let's say Yugoslavia instead wins 2-1 in our timeline. Then in the final group stage match, Yugoslavia would face Brazil in what would be one of the highlight matches of this round. Brazil were unbeatable against Serbia as they finally clicked into form and were able to manage the game perfectly. Despite our Yugoslav team being very strong, I don't see them being able to defeat the Brazilians, though perhaps it wouldn't be as one-sided as it was against Serbia. In the end, Yugoslavia lose 1-0 and finish second in the group with 6 points behind Brazil 7. This means that in the round 16, Yugoslavia's opponent would be Sweden. The Swedish at this tournament were a very resolute side who were hard to play against even if their squad wasn't exactly blessed with talent. But with all the combined player quality in our Yugoslav team, the Swedes would be no match and would fall 3-1. This means that Yugoslavia would march on to the quarterfinals to play England. At the 2018 World Cup, this English team was surrounded by a lot of media hype, and rightfully so as England finally lived up to their high expectations by reaching the semifinals. However, it must be said that this team did heavily benefit from being on a favorable side of the bracket. Because they finished second in their group, they avoided teams like Brazil or France and instead played Colombia and Sweden. While of course it is hard to call any team that makes it to the World Cup a bad team, I personally don't think England would have made it as far otherwise. 
This is because this English team was not consistently solid at the back throughout the tournament. They often leaked many goals that were avoidable, and overall they gave up 8 goals. When you line up England against our hypothetical Yugoslav team, I think Yugoslavia would just get the better of the English in a tight match coming out 2-1 winners. And with this victory, Yugoslavia finds themselves in the semifinals of the 2018 World Cup, but who they are playing against is another question within itself. In real life, England was defeated by Croatia, but obviously, Croatia is not participating as they are still a part of Yugoslavia in this universe. As said before, the team that Croatia defeated in the qualification playoffs to reach World Cup Greece would take their place in Group D with Argentina, Nigeria, and Iceland. Croatia stormed through the group stage, easily beating Nigeria and Iceland while crushing Argentina, topping the group while scoring 7 and only conceding 1. Greece would definitely not have as much success as the Croats. This Greek team was not particularly strong and in many ways they were lucky to even make it out of their qualifying group into the playoffs over Bosnia and Herzegovina, another Yugoslav successor state ironically. For example, despite the Croatians going through a managerial change and a steep dip in form, they were still able to easily brush aside Greece 4-1 in the playoffs. So if you put Greece in Group D of the 2018 World Cup, they would probably lose all three of their matches and finish bottom. If the other results remain the same, Argentina would top the group with 7 points, while Nigeria would come in second place with 6. In place of Croatia, Argentina would face Denmark in round 16. While not as powerful and as electric as they were in Euro 2020, Denmark were still a formidable side and in the round of 16, they pushed Croatia all the way to extra time and penalties. With this in mind, I predict that the Danes would pull off the upset and eliminate this weak Argentina team who are very fortunate to make it out of the group stage, both in this hypothetical universe and in reality. Afterwards, Denmark would play Russia in the quarterfinals. In real life, the Croatia vs Russia quarterfinal was one of the best matches of the World Cup, with the home advantage motivating Russia to hold on to the bitter end, only getting eliminated on penalties despite having significantly less talent than Croatia. Considering how much being the host nation invigorated this Russian side, I think that they would prove just enough to prevail over Denmark. As a result, Yugoslavia's opponent in the semifinals would be Russia. As powerful as a home advantage can be, it can only take a team so far. Not to mention that this Russian team, who have very little tournament experience, would be extremely fatigued after making it this far. With a professional win, Yugoslavia beats Russia 2-0 to make it to the final. And with this victory, the 2018 World Cup final is set. France vs Yugoslavia. In real life, Croatia heavily outplayed France only for the French to take an unexpected lead after a freak Mandzukic own goal. Croatia equalized with a wonderfully taken strike from Perisic, but just as it looked like Croatia might score again, France were awarded a dubious penalty right before halftime, which Antoine Griezmann scored. Despite having only one single shot the entire half, which was a penalty, France found themselves up 2-1 when the second half started. Because their last three matches went to extra time, Croatia essentially played an entire extra match at the World Cup, and it showed in the second half as both the mental and physical fatigue set in. With about a half hour left, defensive mistakes and exhaustion saw France score back-to-back -back goals from Paul Pogba and Kylian Mbappe, securing the World Cup in French hands, though Mandzukic did make up for his own goal, capitalizing on a blunder from Hugo Lloris. Aside from the obvious fatigue, Croatia's biggest problem was their lack of squad depth compared to that of France. While the starting 11 was very strong, they did not have the same wealth of talent that France could call upon on their bench. Yugoslavia would not have that problem at all. In fact, they would have one of the strongest footballing talent pools in the world. So assuming that France would benefit from the same stroke of luck in the first half, seeing them take a 2-1 lead, the rest of the match would be very different from here on. Without the same amount of heavy exhaustion and now numerous stars to call off the bench, Yugoslavia are able to equalize 2-2 after Mandzukic's goal. As the business end of the match approaches, Yugoslavia is able to utilize their talented bench and maintain control of the game. Then, with minutes left on the clock, the substitute, Sergei Milinkovic Savic, who is known for chipping in with many goals from midfield, pounces on a loose ball in the box after a pass from Mirjana Pjanic, and slams home the winner with a long shot. Seeing Yugoslavia triumph as 3-2 victors when winning Yugoslavia their first ever World Cup and first international trophy. And here our story does come to an end. 
when it's all said and done, football history would be vastly different if Yugoslavia never split up into seven independent nations. While Euro 2020 may not have ended up much differently, could the 2018 World Cup have seen a completely new victor with Yugoslavia as one with their names written on the trophy? Unfortunately, the world will never know.